Uh, this year we have uh, Nigel Inkster talking about his book, Drugs, Insecurity, and Failed States. Um, uh, Nigel is uh, director of the Transnational Threats and Political Risk Program at ISS, uh, means that he covers a range of topics too difficult for his colleagues to tackle, including uh, cybercrime, uh, organized crime, drugs, terrorism, uh, and various others. You can ask him more about them at the end if you, if you so, so wish. Uh, before he joined the ISS, he was for 30 years in the British SIS, um, uh, latterly holding the position of a deputy director. Um, uh, relevant also to this, he is a, a graduate of the, uh, of the COCA Lab model, uh, a module of the, uh, the Colombian Army's jungle warfare program, and uh, has the pictures to prove it. Um, so we are not, it's not an ivory tower study that we're, we're offering here. Um, the drug trade is one of those truly transnational issues and one that really belongs within, within Nigel's program, um, not only something that crops up around the world uh, in various guises, but actually also links regions, often poor countries and rich countries, uh, the different ends of the product production chain. Um, Pressing topic also uh, in the recent, the most recent OAS summit, which was I think in April, was it, in yeah. in, in, in in Colombia, uh, sitting presidents actually raised the issue of, of a new approach to drugs because the existing approach is not working. This is something that has generally uh, it's been a revelation that has generally fallen on government officials after they leave office, but actually some now in office are even talking about it, even though the U.S. administration is not prepared to endorse anything like. Um, um, uh, decriminalization they are nevertheless open now to the idea of, of uh, other other routes so uh, without further ado I turn over to Nigel thank you okay thanks very much ladies and gentlemen uh, thank you for coming and uh, welcome to the Shangri-La dialogue um, I think it's fair to say that this particular Adelphi has uh, attracted uh, rather more attention than is typically the case uh, for publications in this series. Um, and I think that this uh, says less about the intrinsic uh, merits of this book than it does about the propensity for the topic under discussion to give rise to high levels of controversy. I, I can think of few subjects in the security agenda that uh, generate uh, stronger feelings than the issue of drugs. And uh, it, is an, it is a debate uh, around which um, the facts are often in very short supply um, and uh, with a lot of uh, prejudice and misconceptions in evidence about uh, what drugs are, what they do, and you know, what um, um, pretty much everything uh, about them. But the question arises, well, you know, well, what's double I, why is double I, double S uh, doing drugs? And the answer, as uh, Nick alluded to, um, is that the nexus between drugs and violence in the world has been evident for some time, and as we argue in this book, actually growing. Um, we live in a world where interstate conflict um, is uh, almost non-existent and where the incidence of intra-state conflict, civil war, uh, is also declining um, and seemingly um, illustrating the point uh, argued by uh, Professor Steven Pinker that this represents a discernible trend uh, across um, the whole of human history. And that is clearly uh, something to be welcomed. But it remains the case that as the UN World Development Report uh, last year pointed out, uh, up to 1.5 billion people, in other words, close to one-fifth of humanity, live in regions which are affected by various forms of conflict and violence, which don't fall into easy categories of peace, war, political violence, criminal violence, uh, but do suffer significant uh, consequences um, as a result of this violence. Um, and of course it has to be recognized that uh, not all of this violence is enabled or perpetuated by the narcotics trade. There are other 
commodities which um, have the effect of perpetuating and enabling conflict. Um, cases that readily spring to mind, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, uh, these, these are issues where drugs uh, play no part. But it remains the case that uh, narcotics, and in particular the two narcotics, uh, heroin and cocaine, which form the basis of our study, do play a unique and disproportionate role in enabling and perpetuating violence for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, uh, the ease with which they can be grown, uh, particularly in uh, areas of the world which are either ungoverned or, or weakly governed, um, and which command very high markups between the farm gate and retail distribution, largely as a function of the prohibition regime, which puts all the risk um, on um, those prepared to traffic these commodities um, and, and requires you know, the price you know, to, to go up uh, commensurately. And the other point is that uh, these are commodities um, characterized by what one scholar has referred to as low obstructability. In other words, there, are almost, there is also no, almost no limit to the number of routes whereby these commodities can be smuggled or the concealment mechanisms that can be used um, in, in trafficking these drugs. It's also important to recognize that um, there are few cases where drugs in and of themselves have actually given rise to significant violence. If you look at the cases that we detail um, in our book, uh, namely Colombia and Afghanistan as producer countries, Mexico, Central America, and West Africa as transit countries, um, almost all of these had um, a long experience of violence predating their involvement in the drugs trade. Um, in the case of Colombia, this, this is, you know, uh, was always you know, uh, a, a country prone to high levels of violence, and intermittently so too was Afghanistan. And if one looks at the case of West Africa, um, which has been very much affected by the drugs trade, not primarily through violence, we see that um, the nation states of West Africa have been long susceptible to uh, weak governance um, and uh, levels of corruption that predate the drugs trade, but these factors have been significantly exacerbated since the drugs trade arrived to the point where certain West African countries who seemed well on the way to meeting their millennium development goals now face the prospect of slipping back quite dramatically. Um, the way we structured our book uh, is designed to be, if you like, a kind of policy primer for those uh, interested in, in, in getting to grips with what is often a rather arcane subject. And we start by looking um, at why it is that drugs like heroin and cocaine exercise the hold on us that they do. Um, how do they work? You know, why do we want to keep taking them? We look at the problems of estimating the size of a global trade which is illicit, by definition, very difficult to, um, to measure, and where in fact the metrics are um, vulnerable to an error rate of somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. Um, we deal with the origins of the current international prohibition-based regime the impacts, as I just mentioned, of the drugs trade on specific countries and regions. And we then go on to look at um, how effective the current approach has been and whether there exist viable alternatives that might be pursued. 
Um, and our basic contention is that the policies that have been pursued in prohibition um, for the last actually over 100 years have not really delivered the results that um, were expected. And you know, we're not basing this judgment on some arbitrary inkster camoli matrix um, of metrics you know, th 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 that uh, you know, uh, holds the efforts of the international community to account. We are using the international community's own criteria um, and objectives to judge how effective or otherwise uh, this approach has been. And in order to, you know, to know where we are, it's important to know where we've come from and to remind ourselves that uh, 100, 110 years ago, when the problems of um, illicit um, or non-medical drugs consumption had started to uh, assume uh, significant dimensions, we were living in an era where the drugs trade was entirely in the hands of nation states predominantly Western colonial powers. Um, at the turn of the 19th century, more coca leaf was grown in British and Dutch colonial territories, Java, Malaya as then was, Ceylon as then was, than was produced in the Andean region. Um, we have since transited to a situation where the drugs trade has moved from being in the hands of nation states to being entirely in the hands of non-state criminal groups. So we're dealing with a very, very different situation here. Um, but it was the Western colonial monopoly of the drugs trade that was at the center of early efforts to uh, drive it out because Basically, the proposition was that if we could get these countries to stop producing drugs, you know, to, to wind up their um, uh, opium monopolies and so on, this, this problem would effectively go away. So from the outset, the almost exclusive focus of counter-narcotics of activities was on supply reduction. Very little, if any thought, was given to demand reduction. And that essentially remains broadly the case today. So you know nothing essentially uh, has changed. Um, as Nick mentioned, the launch of this book, the original launch in London, coincided with a summit of the Americas at which, for the first time, drugs featured not perhaps exactly on the agenda, but uh, very much in the margins of the agenda. Um, and, you know, obviously I'd like to be able to, you know, claim that this was carefully planned. It wasn't, it was a complete coincidence, but it was one that uh, certainly helped to give our uh, case um, some traction. Um, and I think it, it's no coincidence that during the period that we were uh, researching this book, um, we saw an increase in the incidence of not just retired politicians and officials, but increasingly serving politicians starting to comment uh, to the effect that uh, our current policies might not be working very well and that there was a need for uh, a rethink. And certainly when somebody like uh, Colombian President uh, Juan Manuel Santos um, a politician not uh, generally regarded as, as a great liberal on, on matters of um, security policy uh, comes up with um, statements to this effect. One has to uh, begin to think that uh, something, something is changing, not least because Colombia, the country that I've come to know very well indeed, um, has been presented as a kind of poster child of the efficacy of, of current problems. You know, this, this, is, this is a country that is seen as having effectively dealt with uh, narcotics-enabled uh, security problems and you know, is moving into uh, a post-security phase. Um, in fact, I don't think that this is 
this is true at all. Um, yes, it is true that Colombia has managed to uh, reduce the threat from um, narcotics criminals from something that was potentially existential to something which can be dealt with as uh, a law and order issue. And it's true that it has also uh, pushed a narcotics fueled insurgent movement to the margins of the state, where, it, again, it can be dealt with as uh, something that doesn't constitute an existential problem, but at a very considerable cost. Um, large numbers of deaths and injuries, um, as many as four million internally displaced p persons, you know, a bill for um, post-conflict reconstruction and reparation and uh, um, reintegration uh, going into billions of dollars. And still it remains the case that Colombia is affected by high levels of criminality um, and the quantities of cocaine that emanate from Colombia have diminished somewhat, but not that markedly. And any shortfall from Colombia has more than been compensated by increases in production elsewhere in the Andean region. So all this has been done, but the actual amount of drugs you know, going onto world markets had not uh, significantly um, reduced. And this, you know, we, we are asked to think, is, is a success story. Uh, when we turn to heroin, we look at the problems of Afghanistan, uh, where effectively um, narcotics have uh, both fueled uh, a long-running insurgency, uh, but also uh, because of the involvement of significant elements of the Karzai administration in the drugs trade, have actually created and perpetuated the circumstances which drive that uh, insurgency. It's proven impossible for NATO ISAF to, de to devise effective policies which combine counter-insurgency and counter-narcotics. And our conclusion is that the two are simply um, at contradiction with each other. Um, and the likelihood is that um, the situation in Afghanistan following the NATO ISAF drawdown is almost guaranteed to get much worse in terms of um, opium poppy cultivation as all actors in the Afghan scenario stockpile resources for an uncertain future. So we don't see any um, you know, alleviation in sight there. Um, and I think at this point we have to perhaps stop and, and take stock. Uh, Donald Regan, who was uh, Ronald Regan, uh, um, I forget his exact position in the White House, uh, was reflecting on his experience as a very young official during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And when asked what lessons you know, he drew from that crisis, uh, famously said, don't just do something, sit there. Um, and we think that uh, you know, latterly, we've been doing quite a lot of uh, not actually that effective activity, and maybe the time has come to sit down and do a bit more thinking about what would constitute um, some, some more effective policies. And we try in our book not simply to admire the problem, as they say in US academia, but to offer some thoughts about possible alternatives and, and, and different approaches. Um, and you know, what, 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 what are the uh, points that you know, we, we really want to try and, and make and the points that I want to leave you with? Firstly, we think that the issue of drugs misuse needs to be fundamentally reframed. When one has an intractable problem, um, reframing it can in itself be a useful exercise in helping you to determine which aspects of the problem really are important, really matter, and which might actually be capable of, of being dealt with. Uh, but we, we need to reframe this problem not 
as a problem that can be solved, this idea of a drugs-free world, but as a situation, a phenomenon to be managed, and managed in a way which creates minimal collateral damage, which we don't think now is currently the case. At the moment, it is you know, the, the you know, weak and vulnerable states which are effectively carrying the can for demand which is almost exclusively emanating from, from the developed uh, Western economies. And we think there, you know, there is a fundamental inequity here that needs to be addressed. Um, every year, the international community reports back to itself, announcing, in effect, that it's failed to meet its objectives and that it's going to carry on doing exactly the things that uh, have uh, resulted in this failure. And you know, we think that this, is, you know, the, 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 this in itself is cause for a rethink. In 1998, the UN General Assembly Special Session, UNGAS, pledged to bring about a drugs-free world within a decade. A decade later, in 2008, when no, this had had no perceptible impact on levels of production or consumption, they gave themselves you know, a, a stay of execution for another decade. Uh, mm, okay. um, you know, um, and as I just mentioned, you know, the mere existence of Afghanistan and the security problems that uh, emanate from there uh, ensure that, you know, of itself, this objective is not going to be met, irrespective of what happens anywhere else. Um, and you know, meanwhile, we shouldn't forget that the corollary to the objective of a drug-free world, meaning a drug, a world in which uh, non-medical drug use no longer exists, is a world in which adequate supplies of drugs for licit medical purposes are available to all those who need it. And here, the record is frankly equally, if not more, dismal. With the exception of a handful of, a small handful of developed Western economies, access to opioid um, drugs for late stage and palliative care um, is, you know, at best patchy, at worst non-existent. And a lot of people uh, who could benefit from these drugs and uh, enjoy uh, or get some pleasure from the last stages of their lives are deprived of the opportunity to do so for all sorts of reasons, often frankly misconceived. Um, secondly, we think that consumer countries can do a lot more for themselves by very consciously and deliberately moving from an approach to consumption based on penalization to one which focuses much more on treating drugs misuse as a public health issue. And this is something which the 1988 convention, the third convention in the trio which you know, governs the prohibition-based approach, explicitly endorses. It says that you know, it's, it's acceptable to treat people medically for drug addiction rather than to, rather than to incarcerate them. And if anybody needed an illustration of how ineffective incarceration is for dealing with drugs, I would refer you to a recent report in the UK by Her Majesty's Inspector of Prisons, which um, highlighted the case of uh, Her Majesty's uh, prison, Durham, where 13% of inmates who exited that prison on completion of their sentences had a drugs problem which they had not had when they were first incarcerated. Yeah. Uh, okay, that was an extreme example, which is why it was raised, but I think it gives you, you know, an illustration of the shortcomings of, 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 of this approach. Um, and it's very interesting to reflect, we make the point in our book, that when Richard Nixon um, launched his so-called war on drugs in 1971, his conception of how this would work within the United States was that money um, devoted to uh, dealing with drugs problems that he managed to get out of Congress would primarily go to public health programs. You know, this was you know, Nixon, the drugs warrior's vision of how things should go. Since then, things have gone a very, very long way from that. Um,
we cite various uh, pieces of theoretical economic research that have been done by reputable organizations like the Rand Corporation, suggesting that actually uh, medical rehabilitation is not just the most effective, but also the cheapest way of dealing with uh, um, drugs misuse. Uh, and we also cite a very interesting experiment uh, which has been taking place in Portugal for the last decade. Portugal has decriminalized the possession of all drugs for personal use although trafficking remains a criminal offence. And the results of that experiment are actually quite interesting insofar as some of the worst social and criminal behaviours of drugs use have uh, marginally declined, even though actual drugs use has marginally increased. Um, and perhaps the most interesting thing is that uh, international drugs traffickers do not seem to have decided that uh, Portugal is a soft underbelly uh, around which they can congregate, which is often an argument for um, not going down this route, at least not on a selective basis. Um, and we think actually that it would be helpful if rather than rigidly enforcing a one-size-fits-all counter-narcotics strategy on every country, um, that such scope for subsidiarity as there is within the conventions can be permitted such that countries, while subscribing to the overall objectives of the um, current regime, which I think all of us would agree are inherently unexceptionable, do actually have more leeway to pursue policies that take account of their particular national circumstances. At the moment, the scope to do this is limited. And we see, for example, that the US State Department uh, um, comes up with a knee-jerk response every time any country uh, uses the term harms reduction, which is seen as equating with tolerating or, if not encouraging, drugs use. Um, so we think there is more uh, to be done in this regard. But of course, while decriminalization of drugs makes life easier for consumer states and certainly makes life a lot easier for uh, people who suffer from drug addiction, that of course doesn't deal directly with the problems that we address in our uh, book of uh, um, serious violence and um, criminality, which is fed by um, a, a black market. And of course, the logical response to this is to, uh, which is put by numerous advocacy groups, is uh, legalization, which most of these groups do not intend as a kind of free for all, but rather as a, a system in which drugs, though legal, are strictly uh, regulated. Um, in, in the way that um, people are able to access them through um, various licensing regimes, uh, medical prescription, depending on uh, the particular drugs in question. Of course, the obvious uh, objection to this, which is the one that um, is um, made by the international drugs community, based on the counterfactual, as it necessarily must be, is that this would give rise to a huge spike in consumption? Uh, well, you know, the honest answer is we don't know. But actually, there are some elements of research which suggest that it may not be quite as simple as that. Uh, for example, um, there is economic research which suggests that a drug like heroin is actually not very price elastic. In other words, if the price of heroin declines, levels of usage do not uh, see a proportionate increase. This is not true of cocaine. Um, and um, you know, we, if one looks, for example, at uh, the way that um, social uh, policies have been devised to outlaw effectively uh, the consumption of tobacco in, in public places and to make this a, a, a much 
less socially acceptable habit than uh, it, it uh, previously was. This too, perhaps, offers uh, some scope um, um, for for further thinking. Um, of course, in a, a legalization regime, serious organized criminal groups would not go away. You know, they would carry, they would continue to operate, they would continue to um, um, try to raise revenue by all sorts of other criminal activities. This is in the nature of organized criminal groups who, in my experience, and you know, as Nick referred to, I've had quite a lot, um, have no particular brand loyalty to any one activity or commodity, but simply go for whatever is most profitable and least risky. Um, we would, I think, however, see quite a significant decline in uh, low-level criminality, uh, particularly at the street retail um, end of the market, which is very labor-intensive, um, but involves a lot of people who, frankly, do not have the capability, intellect, or ambition to be serious career criminals. And as many criminologists will tell you, uh, involvement in crime is to a significant degree a function of opportunity as much as anything else. So one can argue with some conviction that deprived of an opportunity, this element of uh, criminality might actually uh, decline quite significantly. Um, either way, under a legalization regime, organizations like uh, the Drugs Enforcement Agency in the United States need not fear for their future. You know, we'd still need organizations like this to police any different regime in much the same way as you know, in the United States they have a Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms to police commodities which are legal and, at least in the latter case, seen as an, an integral part of the American way. Um, but we have to accept realistically and politically that the barriers to radical change are formidable and they are not going to disappear overnight. Um, and we have to reconcile ourselves to dealing with the problems that we've got now rather than to imagine that, that, that we can quickly transition to some very different future. And I think perhaps the last point that I'd like to make, because I want to leave time for questions, is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, it is producer and transit states that tend to pay the price, the heaviest price by far, for this trade. Um, and um, <coughs> we should bear in mind that when that, that, that these countries, when they are confronted uh, with engagement uh, in the drugs trade, essentially have a kind of almost Mephistophelian choice. Either they can allow themselves and their institutions to be comprehensively corrupted by this trade, or they can stage a fight back with all the costs and violence that that implies. We've seen recent years in Mexico effectively that is what has happened. For many years, the you know, institutionalized revolutionary party operated a policy of complicity with drugs traffickers. Um, some years ago, um, a strategic decision was taken to reverse that policy and to go after the drugs traffickers. And the results have been, as we have witnessed them, in you know, a seemingly endless uh, series of uh, newspaper reports detailing the horrors that ha ha have resulted. We have other states, for example, like Tajikistan, which is a key player in the transit route out of Afghanistan, um, also a country whose institutions have been comprehensively corrupted uh, by this traffic, um, and effectively unable to confront it uh, through the use of uh, security policies and force for fear of falling back into a civil conflict from which they've only just emerged. But our contention is, the last point I will make, is that uh, when countries do decide to stage a fight back, they really do deserve um, some help. 
And in this regard, although we are in some regards critical of uh, U.S. counter-narcotics policy, in particular the focus on uh, supply side to the almost total exclusion of anything else, um, I think the, the USA's record in this regard um, you know, is, much more, is much more respectable. And you know, I've cited Colombia as an obvious case in point where significant uh, U.S. Uh, support and intervention at a critical juncture effectively prevented from Colombia, Colombia from falling over. The only other country, Western uh, consumer country, that uh, provided any useful help to, to the Colombians, at least in the hard security element of this fight back, was the United Kingdom. A lot of other countries refused to get involved in providing hard security assistance to Colombia because of concerns about uh, human rights violations that were undoubtedly taking place and were indeed a legitimate cause for concern. But our contention is that standing on the sidelines and wringing one's hands um, is not an effective response in such circumstances. Uh, and that constructive, critical engagement, providing useful assistance, but also demanding a price in terms of improved behavior, actually represents a much more effective um, and, we think, honorable approach to dealing with this problem. Bottom line is, we really think that uh, it's time for international narcotics trade to be pulled out of the silo, this very specialized silo that it has long inhabited, and to be more integrated into the mainstream of international security uh, and economic development thinking and strategies. Um, this you know, to do what uh, Colombia's President Santos has called for, which is to undertake a comprehensive re-evaluation of existing policies on the basis of empirical research and open debate with no options automatically off the table. Thank you very much. Uh, Nigel, thank you. Uh, we all have a date for our diaries to note whether the next 10-year deadline to, in effect, change yeah. human nature is any more successful than the previous one. Um, several uh, chapters within the book are actually focusing on some of the security uh, fallout of the drugs trade for producer states and transit tra states. So if you want to ask questions on those, like Nigel can take those as well as, as, as questions on, on the argument that, that comes across. I mean, from my own perspective, with the pre-candidate perhaps just a month away from being re-elected in Mexico, it'll be very interesting to see if the old party can actually get that particular genie back in the bottle. Uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, please, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Eric San Juan of Opinion in News Asia. I'm from the Philippines. Uh, you appropriately uh, tackled about the issue of heroin and cocaine, but uh, we have a bigger problem here in Asia, which is the so-called synthetic drug, meaning the poor man's drug, which is the shabu. And uh, this shabu is being uh, smuggled worldwide now. And uh, do, you have any, do you have any update regarding this matter or any information about this? Because uh, this is the, the bigger problem of the world this time. Well, I think it is undoubtedly the case that uh, you know that, that this is a problem. But this, this is a different type of drug because it is a drug that can be produced. Uh, it's, it's a drug that is produced synthetically and hence can actually be produced much closer to the sources of consumption than is typically the case with cocaine and heroin. Um, you know, there's no re you know if you, if you want to sell this stuff, you're talking about methamphetamines and related. Uh, um, synthetic drugs. There's no reason why you can't manufacture these in you know, factories and laboratories, you know, in the cities, you know, um, where, where you're where you're proposing to to sell them. Now, I accept that this has been a problem in uh, Southeast Asia, particularly in Thailand, for example, where we saw um, under Taksin Shinawat uh, a a policy of cracking down on uh, drugs trafficking, which uh, resulted in very significant. Uh, levels of extrajudicial killings, which may or may not have been uh, you know, 
drugs related. You know, it's certainly the case in, in the Philippines that uh, um, th this is a commodity that uh, uh, fuels criminality and, and uh, enables violence. But I don't think it's happening on quite the same scale as um, you know, heroin and um, uh, cocaine. And it, you know, I mean, I, I don't underestimate the you know the harms and addictive properties uh, of 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 methamphetamines. You know, the, the, these these are you know clearly you know serious problems. And you know things like you know, methamphetamines can make you think that you're Superman, and you 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 then try and leap buildings with a single bound and find that it doesn't actually quite work. So that they are extremely dangerous. Um, you know, but again, we are, we're up against the the, the, the problem. Where, where where does the intrinsic value of these things come from? You know, it costs next to nothing to produce this stuff. You know, the value comes from the fact that they are prohibited commodities. That is why you know people you know uh, take the risk of trafficking in these commodities because the rewards are significantly great. Um, so, a question arises: you know, might it be easier to um, break this um, malign nexus by rethinking uh, the prohibition uh, element of this. We're not saying that that is the answer, because I don't think there is an answer, but uh, you know, it, is, it is for reflection, for consideration. from the International Drug Policy Consortium. I haven't read the book, so I'm not familiar with the, the research that has been into it. I was curious as to the extent to which you might have gone into the actors behind the drug trade. And I was interested to see how, whether you can draw a clear line between those who are involved in the drug trade and those who are in the state apparatus that govern and drive and determine drug policies. So when we talk about what might be possible and how can we change or even consider um, opening up a debate on drug policies. Um, what kind of obstacles are there in government, perhaps, or in the power structures that exist that might stop that from happening? Well, of course, you know, there, 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 are, there are lots of different interest groups um, you know, who, who um, would uh, be resistant to change. Um, you know, the governments of uh, major consumer countries like the United States, you know, arguably find it easier to deal with a drugs prohibition uh, regime that actually puts uh, the onus more on uh, consumer, on, on producer countries. Uh, that was certainly the case when the 1961 convention came into being. Um, you know, there, there are other powerful uh, domestic uh, interest groups like, for example, the correctional lobby in the United States who, not to mince words, you know, have, have a powerful financial interest in incarcerating Amer as many Americans as possible. Um, you know, then you know, if we look at uh, you know, fragile states like uh, Afghanistan, we see, for example, that um, within the Karzai administration, you know, there, there are powerful former warlords uh, who derive quite significant revenues from the uh, narcotics trade, principally through control of the trafficking routes but who at the moment are actually deriving more of their income from uh, embezzling uh, a huge American uh, and Western aid budget way beyond the absorptive capacity of a very fragile state. Uh, but as that um, aid budget necessarily diminishes, it is logical to assume that uh, narcotics will um, you know, uh, represent a an increasing share of the revenues of these actors, who, although they are part of uh, the national government, can be considered you know, to, to, to be you know, uh, to have um, an interest in in state weakness. You know, the, 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 you know, a strong state threatens their their rent-seeking uh, uh, capabilities. So the last thing they want is you know, an effective counter-narcotic strategy, which uh, which closes them down. Of course, this last phenomenon is particularly pernicious uh, when one is looking at a state where 
you know, effective governance and institutional and and and, uh, and and institutional building are so important, you know, to to, to the survival of, of of this country. Um, so you know, there are lots of interest groups. I mean, you know, the, the whole uh, international counter narcotics um, industry, for want of a better word, you know, uh, sees itself as having a a, a strong interest uh, in 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 the status quo and. Uh, you know, as a potential loser, were anything uh, dr uh, drastic uh, uh, to change. So, so there are plenty of interest groups there who, who uh, don't want uh, change to come. Yeah, taking your long historical lens, Nigel, Afghanistan is almost the first place that has actually renationalized mm -hmm. uh, the narcotics. Yeah, absolutely, industry. indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that, next, please. Although this is a, another question about methamphetamines, which it sounds like it's not quite as much of a focus of yours as narcotics is, but um, I was wondering if you're familiar at all with the North Korean situation. We frequently over the years have gotten reports that North Korea has been exporting methamphetamines to Japan in particular. And I was wondering how that fits into your, um, obviously with North Korea it would be closely state supported if that's what they're doing. And I was wondering if you're familiar with that situation or if you had any insights about that. Uh, we are uh, we, we we are of course familiar with uh, uh, the, the, this particular phenomenon. Um, North Korean state um, raising revenue through a variety of uh, illicit activities, not just uh, smuggling of uh, synthetic drugs, but also things like uh, counterfeiting uh, U.S. currency, uh, smuggling. Um, um, non-prohibited uh, substances like uh, you know, alcohol and tobacco, I mean, all, all of these things are, are taking place. We didn't uh, fit it into this book. Uh, we, we simply couldn't uh, address every uh, aspect of a very um, wide-ranging global phenomenon. And in a way, of course, you're right. You know, the, 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 this trade does uh, perpetuate conflict and instability by enabling a very unstable, unpredictable, and, and dangerous actor to, to remain in being and, and, and to continue to, uh, to constitute a, a threat uh, to, to, to this particular region. Um, but we were more focused uh, in this book on um, the um, human and um, national security um, issues where these affect uh, more vulnerable states, states you know, often not really in a position to help themselves. Uh, in the case of North Korea, you know, you're absolutely right that this, this is, you know, the decision to engage in this trade is, you know, very much um, you know, um, a factor of, of, of policy. You know, it could be reversed. Um, my question is regarding um, the um, how much effect a drug trade has on an economy. Say it's hard to let go of the fact that it is it is in a bad way or a good way a contribution to the economy. And how slowly can you really phase out such a, a trade? Because it will eventually affect some jobs and create some unemployment, right? Yes, well, of course it will. And Afghanistan, another case in point, about uh, you know, half a million Afghan households are currently uh, dependent uh, for their income on, on cultivating opium. Um, and uh, take that take that uh, away from them. They they've really got nothing, and this is one of the reasons why um, eradication policies that have been attempted in Afghanistan have been so signally unsuccessful. I mean, if one looks at, uh, for example, West Africa, one sees there that organised uh, trafficking groups have begun in certain communities to provide some of the services and amenities that the state is not able to provide. Uh, we saw this in uh, city, you know, Colombian cities like Medellin and Cartel and, and, and Cali, sorry, in the, in the 1980s. You know, the Escobars uh, were a more you know, um, um, effective source of employment and um, more effective supplier 
of uh, social welfare services than was the Colombian government. Um, and it is very difficult uh, to, 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 to turn this around, you know, to wind it down you know, in, 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 in the short term. Um, so, you know, I mean, there, you know there, there, there are real problems here. There is also the question, of course, you know, um, when narcotics money goes into an economy, when does it stop being a narcotics money? You know, uh, what's the difference between a hospital that's been built with narcotics money and one that's been built with money from legitimate sources of taxation? You know, is, is the standard of medical care, you know, inherently any inferior? I don't think it is. Um, so you know there, there there are real problems you know with this in 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 in, in winding you know in, in winding this down. We have to recognise that. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Hi, sir. Uh, thanks for your time today. My question is, uh, what are the challenges and obstacles that you face when you set up this uh, when you write this book, and what will you be coming up any uh, next issue or something to related with this uh, this uh, first book? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you know, there were lots of challenges um, um, in, in addressing this book. Um, firstly, you know, w w was uh, getting to grips with and uh, being confident of understanding you know, a, a very complex um, set of issues and trying to boil them down into something that uh, was you know, accessible to and might actually be read by a policy community without you know, o oversimplifying the issues um, or uh, trivializing um, the, the, the content of the book. So that was uh, one problem. Another problem and another challenge we faced was you know, doing effective field work you know, in, in circumstances where uh, you know, this is not, uh, not so easy to do. We were able to do some uh, useful field work in Colombia and in West Africa but it proved impossible to do any, you know, to, to, to get on the ground in Afghanistan within the sort of time frame that would have been, uh, would have been useful to us. So that, you know, that I think uh, w was a problem. As to where we go from here, um, I, you know, I, I think there is, uh, you know, there, there, there is certainly more that we can do. And one of, the, one of the issues, one of the questions implicit in this book, that we don't actually frame it in quite that way, is the question of when transnational organized crime ceases to be, in effect, an unavoidable tax on globalization and starts to present as a strategic threat in its own right. You know, how, how, how do you decide when that moment comes? How do policy makers decide that, that, you know, that this has become an issue so important that it needs you know, a concentrated um, policy effort to deal with? Um, we argue that you know, if we're not there, then we're very close to being there in, the, in this particular case. There are other uh, serious transnational criminal phenomena Cybercrime being an obvious case in point, which I would argue uh, crosses that particular threshold. Um, and we would certainly like to look uh, more at this aspect and also to consider, for example, whether some of the skills and capacities that um, the world has acquired in dealing with uh, modern transnational Islamist terrorism might be usefully transferred to dealing with some of these uh, phenomena, um, failing which there is a risk that some of them may actually be lost. So you know, th this is another area that we would look, like to look at. And of course, in terms of where we go from here on drugs and uh, international security, we're acutely conscious that we have only scratched the surface. There is a lot more detailed work that could be done, probably most of it not actually appropriate for an outfit like IISS, looking at some of the practical implications of uh, alternative strategies. Hi, um, thanks, for, thanks for the insight. Uh, following up from your earlier uh, response on cybercrime and also transnational uh, organized crime groups, there have, I mean, in recent times there has been suggestions that uh, cybercrime is actually more profitable than the illicit drug trade. Interested to hear your opinions on this. That, sorry, is that more I mean, <laughs> Cybercrime is actually more profitable than the illicit drug trade. Mm -hmm. So I'm, more, I'm interested to hear your opinions on this. 
Mm. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there, there, there are many profitable forms of organized criminality. People smuggling is actually extremely profitable. Um, you know, trafficking licit but highly taxed commodities like cigarettes, you know, can be very profitable, although that, you know, trade has somewhat declined uh, of late. Um, cyber crime, I think, you know, the short answer is we don't know how profitable it is. Nobody really has been able convincingly to put a figure on the costs of cyber criminality. And you know, there, there are you know, figures cited, you know, the British government cites one, you know, uh, various private companies like Symantec you know, come up with, with estimates. But you know, frankly, the, these are all finger in the air exercises. We really don't know uh, what, what, what the true answer is. I do think, however, that cyber criminality um, is becoming a serious problem insofar as it is evident that a number of private sector companies are now having reservations about exploiting fully the capabilities uh, offered by the cyber domain in respect of their businesses because of the perception that the, the risks and damage from criminality outweigh the benefits of uh, pursuing these innovations. So I think when you know, serious companies uh, start to think in those terms, you have to assume that, yeah, this, this is starting to be, you know, be a real problem. Uh, Bob James, please. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Bob James, I'm a businessman. Uh, your, um, your book is about drugs, and you talk largely about drugs, but of course there are different kinds of drugs. Mm -hmm. right? And it would seem to me that uh, you would have to address them in a different way, marijuana being mm -hmm. one. I, could talk about marijuana. I'm probably the only person in here that's ever actually smoked marijuana. <laughs> and, and, but you uh, didn't inhale, right? I, no, I, by, by accident I did, and I caught and I had to stop. Mm. Uh, so, uh, how, how can you deal? You, uh, our uh, ex governor in New York, um, mm. uh, Rockefeller, put everybody in jail. Mm -hmm. And that seems to continue in some ways, it doesn't seem like it's exactly the right way to handle it. I agree with you that uh, different drugs, you know, um, have very different effects. Um, and uh, I don't think it's actually been especially helpful that under the international regime, you know, a number of different drugs are brigaded together in different classes. In the UK, we use class A, class B, class C. Um, uh, to you know, to, to determine their sort of toxicity and uh, malign uh, effects, and I, I I think that you know any uh, regime that approached uh, drugs differently would have to look at you know every single drug on its own uh, merits. Um, it is argued that, for example, uh, cannabis, marijuana, though not uh, in itself particularly harmful. Um, is uh, undesirable because it serves as a so-called gateway drug. Once you started using that, you start using other more uh, potent substances. Well, I have to say we simply did not find any convincing evidence that supported that contention. You know, uh, re really, you know, we, I, I looked and I couldn't find any. Um, it's also alleged that uh, stronger forms of cannabis can uh, induce psychosis, particularly in, vul in vulnerable adolescents whose brains, as we now know, are actually rewiring themselves during these difficult years during which they communicate in grunts and uh, you know, uh, generally uh, behave in an obnoxious uh, fashion, as any parent will know. Um, yes, that is true, but at the same time, you know, doctors point out that the levels of uh, this kind of psychosis, uh, schizophrenia and related ailments worldwide are actually declining quite significantly. So I think you know, it, it may be that you know, there you have a particular you know, area of, of uh, potential danger, vulnerability. Um, it may be that uh, you know, all this drug does is uh, um, exacerbate uh, a, a tendency that is already already latent. 
Uh, but it seems to me that actually um, in a drug like uh, marijuana, which is basically a weed and you know, any fool can grow it, and it's basically worthless, uh, it, would, you know, it ought to be possible to devise some kind of uh, um, regulation regime. You know, a bit like when you buy booze in Canada, you've got to sort of do the walk of shame into a government-owned uh, liquor store um, and then sneak out uh, embarrassedly, hoping nobody will notice the brown paper bag you're clutching. You know, um, there's no reason inherently why one couldn't do that. I wouldn't suggest that that would be an option for a drug like uh, cocaine or for, uh, for heroin. But uh, you know, it is possible to imagine uh, a regime for heroin which involved providing uh, maintenance dosages to you know, those addicted to the drug, which is what used to happen in the United Kingdom until the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act. And it seems to me that treating um, people, I mean, you know, I mean, let's face it, heroin addicts are people you know, who we, we call them problem users, but anyone who's addicted to heroin uh, has probably got a lot of problems. And the heroin addiction is probably just one manifestation of, of something far more wide uh, wide ranging, and it seems to me that in cases like that, um, these the, the, these decisions about how to treat, how to deal with the problem, are best left to qualified medical practitioners rather than law enforcement officers, international civil servants, uh, and, and, and what have you. So I think you would have to, yes, you're absolutely right. You'd have to look at drugs uh, in terms of their effect, their impact, uh, and consider you know. Um, you know, different ways of dealing with, with different drugs. Yeah, I, just a moment, I just wanted to uh, take a moment to say uh, Bob James has been uh, a very strong supporter of the Institute. Um, our next Adelphi is on uh, the future of um, American power and the American policing role globally. Uh, it's a project that Bob actually has uh, suggested uh, and has offered some support for and um, he's been very patient waiting for it but the book will be out uh, early July um, so ISS members you'll get your copy in July and thank you Bob I want to take the opportunity just to say thank you for your support gentlemen at the back please uh, here, uh, James Gu coming from Macau satellite television uh, I have a question about your comment in your book on the China's drug policy Mm -hmm. Because there are uh, humiliation during the past 100 years for China, but uh, there are a lot amount of the population who are addicted to any drugs in China now. So, do you really suggestion that Chinese should embrace more liberal policy toward these problems, or uh, you can take care? Of both the human rights and the national security or social security. Thank you. Um, well, ultimately, that's going to be a matter for, for the Chinese. Ultimately, that has to be a matter for the Chinese government to decide. Uh, but uh, relative to many countries, um, you know, China has quite good uh, public health care systems. Um, and um, you know is is better place than many to deal with uh, drugs related problems. I mean you're absolutely right. Um, no, nobody quite sure what the you know what uh, levels of uh, drugs misuse in China are, but from the zero that they were in the 1950s, it's clear that they have been gradually rising. Um, I think you know China uh, claims to have one about one and a half million you know, registered heroin addicts. But of course, if you're a registered heroin addict, then you make yourself liable to a treatment regime, which effectively means being tied to your bed until you've got over the uh, withdrawal symptoms. It's not an attractive prospect. So, unsurprisingly, quite a lot of people don't want to acknowledge that they you know, they, they have this uh, this problem. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we're kind of back where we were a century and a half ago in some respects. You know, part of the reason why in the mid-19th century China had a significant problem with drug addiction was, was due to a significant male-female imbalance, 
you know, a large number of impoverished males had little prospect of uh, getting married, you know, raising children, etc., and so tended to seek uh, refuge in uh, in opium. We're kind of back there again, you know, with 118 males to 100 uh, females, and probably worse. I think there are some parts of China where it's more like 130 males to, you know, 100 females. So we're looking at an entire generation of impoverished young men who are going to be equally disadvantaged in in in, in the uh, marital stakes. Now, will they be tempted to seek solace in drugs again? Well, it seems you know eminently. Um, eminently possible. So, so you know, there, there, there has to be a worry there. I think my main point is that you know, for, 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 for the Chinese government, for the Chinese Communist Party, this goes to a fundamental aspect of political legitimacy. You know, that the, the, uh, you know, the, the Chinese Communist Party uh, presents itself to, to the nation as the party that abolished all the colonial um, humiliation, unequal treaties, you know, opium, etc., etc. Um, and when uh, the uh, self-image and uh, legitimacy of uh, the state is so bound up with those things, I think politically it is extremely difficult for them to move away in another direction. Where, you know, um, where, whether you know, I mean, whether, whether it is, you know, desirable in um, you know social, socio-economic, and human rights terms to do so, um, which I happen to think it is, is another question. Okay. I'll uh, draw things to a close there. I wanted to thank you all for coming today. I wish you a very good SLD, and ask you now to join me in thanking. No, I'm oh, sorry, sir. Perhaps you can catch him at the end. Um, I ask you to join me in thanking Nigel very much.